From the Stand Comedy Club in New York City, this is a special presentation of Sirius XM's Unmasked. Here is your host for the evening, Ron Beddington! He's on Showtime's Billions and has a brand new HBO special, Son of a Gary, Dan Soto! Yeah, perfect. <laughs> That's uh, Dan, of course, his gem. Yeah, uh, that's my family's fight song. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get the Soder Clan riled up, put on some Jimmy Buffett, watch us run through a paper banner. So I watched the special, and I, like you have that song at the end, and I'm like, what did that cost? So it's not going to be the song that plays at the end. It's the only the song that a couple people saw in the screener because we tried to get the rights from Jimmy Buffett to play Margaritaville, and I had a one-off of a person that knew Jimmy very well and could get him this letter I wrote that was like, listen, I have a joke in my special. It's about my dad dying of drinking and being a fan of yours. <laughs> um, it would be awesome if we could use this song. <laughs> and then I tried, like, kind of, you know, you know, giving a little bit of a hand job and be like, you're such a great songwriter. <laughs> I know you know as a songwriter when you get something to work. And then we sent it to the guy, and we sent a clip along. And the first text that we got back was like, hey, I know this guy from Billions. It's a great letter he wrote. I can't promise Jimmy will get back to me, but I'll give it to him. The second text, he's like, oh, no. No, 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 no. I just watched the clip. Jimmy will not be okay with this. And he was like, kind of explained that Jimmy Buffett doesn't like to be associated with heavy drinking. <laughs> Come on! That is fucking beautiful. That's Shakespearean. 50 years, he's made money off people drinking into a blackout. I could honestly call Jimmy Buffett Big Cirrhosis. <laughs> And you'd be like, oh, yeah, he's the, he's the business that's pushing liver disease. By the way, that, that might have sounded like a setup that I knew that story, but I, I really thought you had yeah. the song. I thought we did, too. And then when we got those texts back, I was like, this is even better. Because, you know, as a comedian, you're like, oh, I want things to work out. But if they don't, it's fucking hilarious. Right. So you should just end this special with a woman screaming, fuck Jimmy Buffett. Uh. I, wonder, I wish I could get one of my mom's old voicemails from my dad's answering <laughs> machines that are like, where's the money, Gary? <laughs> you owe five years of child support. Where is it? And it's like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. But uh, no, we actually, I think we got Queens of the Stone Age in the fade. Nice. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Anyone that knows, it's my favorite. It's my favorite band of all time, and my favorite song of all time. So that's pretty cool. Well, that's lucky for you. You're the only one. So boom. Yeah. Very easy. When the other Margarita. If Josh or any of the boys are listening, <laughs> I will fight Ron once we're off the air for your love. Uh, no, yeah, I was hoping we were going to get Margaritaville because um, Cypher Sounds was DJing while when I taped the special at Bowery Ballroom, and he did it after the first show. And then he did it after the second show. Just unprompted started playing Margaritaville. And my mom was the first one that was like, that has to be the song. Yeah. And so, I was like, all right, yeah, that's a great idea. Just like her whole life, she's disappointed once again. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I tried to explain this for people that saw the movie The Joker. But there's a scene where he's, in, he's bathing his mom. And he goes, I want to be a comedian. And she goes, but you're not funny. <laughs> And everyone that watches the movie is like, oh, that stopped him. I'm like, he would have been the funniest guy in the circuit. Like, that kind of stuff makes someone funny. Because then you're like, oh, okay, now I'm going to go write great jokes. And people, I think that's like a part of comedy people don't realize. It's like you get told no a lot. And that's when you're like, oh, fuck, now I want to prove everyone wrong. It is, uh, it is not anything that 
anyone wants to hear from their child, though. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, I want to be a comedian. Yeah. Like, it's great if your friend says that to oh, you. Oh, yeah. You start even, laughing. You're like, you're fucked. Even but, then, though, you're kind of like, why? Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my mom and I had a relationship that I think by the time I was 16, she was kind of like, just fucking stay out of jail. Yeah. And then when I got into college, she was like, just get me a degree. You could do whatever the fuck you want. And so that was like kind of a... I, I know a lot of comedians that have parents that are really against them doing comedy. And I can't imagine what that would feel like. That would be, I think, really hard for me if my mom was like, I don't want you to do comedy. Because she was like, fuck yeah. yeah. But do please do this for me. And then, you know, she, she always stressed the college education. She was like, please... Just get a college education so I feel like I did my job. That's how she always said it. Well, that was very uh, selfish of her. Yeah. Uh, also, it was I, so selfish please that... Please get $60,000 in debt. Can you do that for mommy? Ron, one of the things I love about you is fucking how you just nail it every time because that's just <laughs> what I paid off with this special. <laughs> I mean, almost... Almost... To the number. <laughs> By the way, if that's if you want a bachelor's degree from Arizona, be prepared to fight for 15 years to get an HBO special. Then you can pay off that degree. <laughs> that's what that degree. That's what a journalism degree from Arizona costs. By the way, I love that it's an HBO special. To me, that's the traditional wow. yeah. place. You know what I mean? Like it. Um, Man, it was uh, it was surreal because it happened so fast. It, it's I have a, an amazing agent at UTA named Mackenzie Russos, and she's been my agent for uh, it, you know my whole time. She's been my only agent, and she uh, she's fucking unbelievable. Like she just has an eye for what each person should do, and she's an agent that really encourages like, what do you want to do? And we had this talk, and I was like, I want to do an HBO special. It's the one thing that I think is, is, is just a, a regular-looking, straight, white dude. I'll get buried on Netflix. I will. I don't have an angle. It's just like, what is he? He's like, ah, he's funny. And everyone's like, all right. You need some, And I feel like HBO was the place where they were only giving out a, a finite amount, and it means so much. It's right. why I'm so into comedy. It's why I'm a fan of comedy. Dave Chappelle's Killing Him Softly is the reason I do stand-up comedy. It was the, it's the perfect hour. And it was like a thing, it was a thing that I watched when I was 16 and going through some really heavy shit that I was like, oh, this is, uh, this is great. This is better than drugs and alcohol. This is a way where I can fucking funnel all my weird thoughts into something. So it just kind of came into my life at a really important point, I think. Well, I think if you look where you are right now, you got the HBO special, you got a hit television show that you're part of. The bonfire is doing great. Your stand-up's going great. If you died now, yeah, legend, oh. legend. You know, Ron, we would be like. If you haven't, if you don't think I haven't thought about <laughs> tying up and pushing off <laughs> in an Albany bathroom, right? So that they can use age technology to have Matthew Perry play me in a movie. By the way, I don't know if there's enough technology for that, bro. <laughs> Yeah, God yeah. stopped that. Yeah. <laughs> God was like, we're not going to make it look good. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, man, where I think I'm, uh, I love doing comedy so much. And it's it, sometimes I have to, it's, it's surreal. It's surreal to be doing this. It's surreal to be doing Unmasked. Because I remember 2012 working University of Maryland at Baltimore. And we're in this weird conference room. And it's Chang Wang, Jermaine Fowler, and I. And we're just drinking a bottle of Jameson watching bill burr's unmasked and then and then patrice's unmasked and we found a way to like put it on the thing and we it was a college gig so we knew we were all gonna fucking bomb so we just sat there drinking whiskey being like well i was you know at the old comics watching patrice talk about comedy it was just like one of those fun things that you're like all right now it's time to go take a beating right but that's the kind of shit that if you just hear some of those stories you get yeah a couple of years that's why like if somebody like, just says to you in comedy at, a, at any cer certain point when you're young, hey, you know, it's pretty good. Yep. That's all you need. It's like, people think that you think, oh, I want to be a star, but you just want to know that you can keep going. Man, yeah. I remember specifically, uh, 
a comedy club that was called the Comedy Village. It used to be the old Boston Comedy Club, yep. and they got turned into the Comedy Village, and that was the club where I, I barked at. I barked out front for people to come in, and Joe List always hosted the Monday nights. He would host, and I would bark, and we'd both get blackout drunk. <laughs> it was very, very fun. But I never went on Monday nights before 1230, and the show started at 9 p.m. So I would never get on before 1230, and that... After a while, just you're just doing open mics. You're just doing really shitty gigs. And I remember I was always just bombing on this fucking Monday night show. And one night, I'm just like kind of having fun. There's like maybe five people in the audience. I'm making everyone laugh. And I just had a fun time on stage. And I, and I, I was really down and thinking of like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm living on a couch in Hoboken. I have no money. I'm... I'm not getting good shows. At least in Arizona, I was working casinos and shit where I was getting money. And I'm walking out, and Neil Brennan was sitting by the door. And Neil's the co-creator of Chappelle Show. That's like, to me, the greatest sketch comedy show of all time. Because I think Chappelle's the greatest comedian of all time. So it's like, Neil, Neil was sitting by the door in a very Neil stance. You know, like a fucking old art director. And I'm walking out, and he goes, hey, man, uh, really funny. Like, really funny. I really, you're really funny, man. And I, I just remember that being like, holy shit. Like, I, I remember taking the path train back home that night being like, fucking co-creator of Chappelle Show told me I was funny. And that was just like a little thing. And Big J, Big J was always great. He's such a good person. But the thing about Jay is... I used to be outside smoking, and he would come by to do that show on Monday. And he and I would just end up bullshitting. And I remember being like, this guy's the fucking one of the best. And he's just talking to me. And that was like a reassuring thing. And then to have a fucking radio show with him for five years is beyond that I'd ever be like, oh, fuck. That's crazy. That was like 10 years ago. Well, that's the thing about like what's happening right now. Because I watched the, your special, Son of Gary, and it's pretty much a laugh Every 20, 30 seconds for a fucking hour. I mean, it's yeah. really, it's really, you know, when I'm sitting there watching it, I was just like, when I wasn't laughing, I'm like, fuck, that's another laugh. That's another yeah. laugh. That's, you know, like, it was, like I just had this counter going off. But I want everybody to know this. The funniest comics all showed up to support you in that. Like, there's something that, You've been able to do with your life, uh, you know, if you think about that when you were a young guy, to know those people all showed up for you and were fucking like, yes, yeah. that was the special. You know, Man, it's amazing. That was, it was, uh, it's still like, I think something that hasn't really set in because it was so surreal. Just to, I, I didn't, I've never done a special in New York. And so to have everyone there and have it be like a true home game. But then, um, you know, you get, I think when you're under pressure, you get mad at shit that you shouldn't really get mad at. And Nate Bargetsy is one of my best friends. And we speak in this very, like, when you have a good relationship with someone, you can go two weeks and then call them, and it's just, like, you didn't miss a day. But I got in my own head, and I was like, I haven't heard from Nate. Like, I haven't heard from Nate. And that kind of just, like, bugged me. And I, I, I called Shane Gillis, and I was like, I don't know, I'm just, like, a little upset that I haven't heard from Nate. I told Vecchion. I was like, I haven't heard from Nate. You know, and Vecchione's like, yeah. And Vecchione's like my brother. Vecchione's like my big brother where he's like, yeah, fuck that. That's kind of fucked up. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, isn't it? And it's like, yeah, yeah. And he's fucking start getting mad. And then in between shows, I see Big J come up the stairs of the Bowery Ballroom with this smile on his face. And then he opens his body and fucking Nate's like, hey. And I was like, <laughs> you motherfucker. And I was like. But it was, it was immediately I felt stupid and, and loved and then like all the things at once where I was like, what was I upset about? And I have, I have such good friends that also happen to be the best comedians in the world. It's true, man. It's fucking insane. Joe List says that and it always makes me laugh. He's like, we're, we're friends with the funniest people in the world. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we're friends with Dave Attell. He's the funniest person in the world. Isn't that insane? And you're like, oh, fuck. You yeah. don't realize that. Yeah, it's really, really true. Yeah. I mean, you could just have gotten over by being just friends with them, even if you didn't do anything with your career. Yeah. You know I mean, like, there's people who are like, I was at the comedy store with Letterman. Yeah. You know, and you're like, fuck, sit down. I want to hear everything. But you're literally 
in that group and doing your own shit while you're being friends yeah. with those people. It's amazing. It's uh man, it's it's so fucking great and humbling and just incredible. It's incredible. From someone that used to just watch comedian the documentary every night, watching Colin Quinn tell Jerry how to build an hour and be like, fucking Colin's the man. And it goes to that from him coming upstairs and seeing me at the cellar being like, ah, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. You know? Like, yeah. Hey, Colin. You know, and yeah. he's like, ah, fucking. One of the first times I started to work in the cellar, he goes, he just looks over me. He goes, "How tall are you?" I go, I go six three. He goes, "You should be playing fucking middle linebacker." Like, oh, like, oh, you're too fucking big. And I was like, "Ah, oh, man, this is." It was surreal. You know, because yeah. like, Colin to me is the guy. Colin is like, to me, he is the top. He's Yoda. He's like. He would hate that. Yeah, yeah. He'd be like, fuck you, I'm a fucking that old. But it's like... <laughs> like, he is everything. There's people in this business that you meet that you're disappointed you met them. There's people that you meet and you're like, fuck, man. That's who you are? And then there's people like Colin Quinn and Dave Attell and Jon Stewart. And you meet them and you're like, thank God. Yeah. You uh, To quote Dennis Green, they are who we thought they were. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's name some of the shitty ones. Yeah. Oh. I mean, that's the real interest. I got a couple owners that I want to fucking wipe out. Time to tsunami some fucking unfair club owners. I'm still waiting for my advance. <laughs> yeah. But this is, uh, I mean, this is already beyond your dreams, right? I mean, it's yeah, beyond I mean, anything that you would have hoped for. I think there was a moment when I was a teenager in Aurora and I was just kind of like uh, so fucking directionless and just kind of like the only thing I enjoyed was getting fucked up and making my friends laugh. That was like it. It's all I wanted to do. I was trying to go to therapy. My sister got killed in a car accident when I was 16 and it kind of like... Uh, it Wait, hold that, on. Let the yeah. moan go on. That's really nice. That, was, that almost felt like a sarcastic <laughs> moan. Oh, uh, fucking here we go again. This fucking. I, when I heard that whine like that, I'm like, is Bonnie McFarlane here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, like, oh, I didn't know you were a loaf of bitch. Uh, yeah. But I think there was this moment where I, I kind of just, everything was like, oh, fuck everything. Fuck yeah. life. I'm just going to get fucked up and I just want to hang out with my friends. And uh, to my mom's credit, she just was kind of like, Hey, if that's what you want to do, don't go off the rails, but, you know, feel free to get fucked up. Yeah, because it's not in your family's DNA, so it's really yeah. smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't come from a long line of yeah. crippling alcoholism. <laughs> yeah, my mom was like, you've got to play. I was like, thank you. <laughs> she gave me the, uh, the Adrian speech. I right. want you to win. <laughs> I want you to get drunk. I'm like, Gang! <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. It was like a real, my mom kind of let off, kind of took her hands off. It was kind of like, just go and be yourself. And yeah. I think she kind of knew that uh, I had a decent enough head on my shoulders that it would correct. It would. Uh, so you were definitely the funny kid, right? Because I always think of like your whole crew, everybody that you came up with. Yeah. Are the naturally funny people. I don't think there's like a comedy nerd studying you know just timing and you know what i mean i think we're like naturally funny guys who don't want to admit that we're massive comedy nerds uh -huh. because it's like uh anybody that i came up with from sam Morrill, mark norman joe list you know like all these people creek in the cave rebecca trent made a very awesome incubator for a lot of young comedians my group specifically came up at creek in the cave where you could just yeah. fail aggressively yeah and it and it it brought us all together, but everyone we were always just talking comedy. We were always just nerding out and being like, "Oh, see this person's bit and fucking oh god damn it, Mulaney has this new one that's fucking perfect." And I saw you know like Greg Rogel has this joke, and we just Joe List was the first person that I met when I moved here that was just like, "Let's just talk, let's just talk comedy all the time," and that just became how we bonded and got closer. He showed me like he really got me into Regan. And I was showing him like Hicks stuff that he didn't he knew but didn't really like. And I was like, you gotta give it another shot. And it just became this like incredible thing. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We were we were just the people. I say there's two types of comedians. There's people that learn how to be funny, that learn the equation of like A plus B equals C. Right. And then there's the people that are funny as a self-defense mechanism, just as yeah. a way to as a life 
philosophy. Right. And I'm proud that my friends are the second. You know, and also I think for that kind of funny person, going to your first open mic is more difficult than it is for somebody who's studied comedy. Because you're like, you're already thinking I'm a funny person. Yeah. I know it. And if these fuckers tell me I'm not, who am I? You know what I mean? It's a really scary proposition. I had a weird, had a weird one where my first open mic, I was kind of like, let's just see how this goes. And yeah. it went well. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And then I ate shit for three months. Yeah. Just every time I went, I was like, "Not why is none of this working?" <laughs> yeah. And this uh, incredible comedian that that was on the morning show at the radio station I worked at, named Dave Ashley. He's uh, since passed away, but he was just an unbelievable guy that that kind of came to me and was like, "Listen, I know you're trying to be a comic. Write jokes. Prepare. You have to prepare yourself for the stage, or else you're, it's going to spiral." And it really was the first time I started putting down set lists and kind of ideas was because Dave Ashley. So do, that was. Do you think you could mention that to Big J? So yeah. that, uh, yeah. He could do a joke twice. Yeah, me, is that out of the, is that out of the question, J? Let me re-correct one of the best <laughs> comics working. You know, like, uh, but Big J's a guy where I always say to like our fans, of uh, Bonfire fans, I'm always like, go see, like if you come see me in your town, you can see me once, you got it. Go see Jay multiple times because it's a different show because he's so fucking funny off the top of his head that it's like, I don't want to see Jay work bits. I want to see Jay yeah. ask someone a question and then it leads to finding out that the waiter bleaches their asshole. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I, I like watching that. Yeah. Well, good, because that happens every show. Yeah. Every show. And I know everything about every waiter in this place. <laughs> Yeah, but that's like um, that's something where being living with Vecchione and then doing a radio show with Jay, you get the best of both worlds. You get one of the greatest writers in comedy, and you get the net, most naturally funny off the top of his head guy. And so I feel kind of lucky just to be around those two so much. It's very strange. Like we're talking about the whole crew that you came up with. None of you are funny in the same way. Everybody yeah. is this very weird on their own. Path, but you guys run together yeah, yeah i think that was bec i think one of the cool things about my group of friends and the guys and and women i came up with were everyone wanted to be themselves and we also came up at a time where i don't know if it's still the same but you could check each other i remember nate being like hey buddy you're sounding a lot like bill burr you mm -hmm. know like 2011 because i kept going right you know <laughs> right I, just shitty jokes, me being like, dating's hard, right? <laughs> you know? And Nate's like, why are you doing that? Yeah. You know? And you're like, oh, fuck, yeah, I got to stop doing that. You weren't even noticing I didn't, it. Yeah. I, I was fucking rocking on the mic. <laughs> being like, yeah, yeah, fucking. You know what I mean? Because Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians, and I was watching him. He was a guy that just fucking blows your mind. And when you're a young comic, you're like, oh, shit, it's... um. It's a thing where you're influenced. It's just, you're just genuine. You're, you're influenced by it, and you don't realize you're doing it. But you have to have a friend there to be like, "Hey, yeah. kind of coming off like that." And yeah. You're like, "Fuck, sorry." And Nate is the best person yeah. for that. Hey, buddy, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you sound exactly like yeah. him. You're like, oh, <laughs> shut up, shut up, Nate. <laughs> By the way, Nate sounds like no one, yeah. no human. Nate sounds like, like if like a him. basset hound became a human. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, I'm sleepy. I'm always sleepy. <laughs> oh, that's so fucking funny. Yeah. But it's great. And it's like, you know, um, Michelle Wolf is a person that I talk to daily. And, and it's, it's still that relationship where she's like, ah, I think I've heard that joke before. And it's like Sam Morrill. There's always people, Mark Norman. There's people you can check jokes with at any time of the day. One of the coolest moments in comedy and also one of the most embarrassing moments in my career was Dave Attell is notorious for calling comedians and being like, does anybody do this joke? Vecchione is his go-to because Vecchione's like an encyclopedia. One time Vecchione was busy and he calls me and I was in San Francisco and he goes, Attell's going to call you and run jokes. And then it's like getting a call from the president. <laughs> you're just like sitting looking at your phone and you're like, oh, fuck. And it's unknown. He always calls from an unknown number. It's fucking true. If you ever get a phone call from a tell, it's unknown. And so I fucking, 
I rem- I'll never forget. I was in the back of a car in San Francisco, and I picked up the phone. And I go, hello? And he goes, Dan, Dave. And I go, hey, Dave, what's up? And he goes, want to run these jokes? Cereal. And he goes, I got his end up. And he like fucking Tommy guns. 12 of the best jokes I've ever heard. And then he finishes and he goes, does anyone have those jokes? And I go, uh, I go, no, 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 not that I've heard of. Also on that serial joke, you could say, and he goes, not looking for tags. And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I, uh, I called Vecchi on and I was like, I fucked up. I fucked up. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't want to know. It's fucking David Tell. I tried giving him a tag like an idiot. But yeah, that was like, that was one of the most coolest and embarrassing moments. Do you think that uh, Dave even knows that people feel about him that way? Or? No, I think yeah. he, um, I think he really is like a, like a isolated samurai. Yeah. Like, you know, he's just, he just lives in his little cherry blossom valley, just doing fucking smoking American spirits and writing the greatest jokes of all time. Yeah. And then when you tell him it, he just gets like... Yeah, that's the worst Like when you did Unmasked at Skankfest with a tell, it was like people heard Zeppelin was back together. Right. Like like to get on the side of the stage to listen, it was just comics staring at a wall listening. That's what the side of Unmasked for a tell was. And it was like, he's the guy. Dave Attell and Colin Quinn are the two most important people in the history of New York comedy. I truly believe that in a way of like... And you're up there yourself, Ron. Stop it. I'm serious. I think there's... I think there's these certain legends that fucking kind of make it okay for young guys to feel like they're comics. You know, what I mean? you need the Patrices, but you also need the Collins. You need the guys to be like, "Shut up, you stink." <laughs> and that's what Bobby Kelly. You know, Bobby was always like, "Bobby's like my older brother." I've never. I'm an only child, but what I feel like an older brother is is Bobby Kelly. Because he'd be like, "Shut up, stupid. You can fucking." You can murder for a half hour, but you can't fucking headline. <laughs> and then uh, I, I remember I was headlining Sanford and Sons in Kansas City, and it was at this shopping mall in Kansas. I'm walking through a hot Target parking lot to Cold Stone, and I call Bobby, and I'm like, Bobby, I'm fucking bombing out here. And he goes, you wanted to be a headliner. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it is. This is fucking what it is. And it's like, man, you need Bobby's, but then you also need, like, the Attells for when you get off stage. He's like, that joke's funny. And you're like, <gasps> what the fuck? Mm. Attell. I used to have this joke about homeless. I didn't understand homelessness until I started ha- being an alcoholic. Because when I was young and I saw homeless people outside, I'd be like, go inside. <laughs> but after 10 years of having a drinking problem, I was always, I'd look at a homeless guy and be like, man, I bet that guy was so fun seven years ago. <laughs> And I got off stage and it tells like, that's really funny. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm just going to stop doing comedy now. Because <laughs> when you have him, you know, it's just, it, it's why New York comedy is so special to me. It's just because you can just walk into a club and all of a sudden your heroes are just sitting there being like, are you next? And you're yeah. like, uh, yeah, yeah, I think. I always think it's great when they come up and you're like, how are they? And like, they blow. You oh. know what I mean? You're like, really? Do you? They suck. I will forever uh, be just a Conan O'Brien fanatic just because, I mean, not only, I mean, I grew up on The Simpsons, his SNL years were unbelievable, his, his late night show was my favorite, but I got to do Conan twice, and the second time I did Conan, I didn't like my set. I just felt like the crowd was tired, the jokes were could have been better, I could have been better, and I finished the set, and Conan calls me over to the couch to say goodnight, and I was like, oh, fuck. And I, you know, I'd done the show before, so I'd met him. But this time he called me over and he's like, comes back. He's like, Dan Soder, everyone. All right, we're leaving. And, I, and then at the end of the show, he goes, what'd you think? I go, I didn't like my set. He goes, that crowd fucking sucked. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, holy shit, Conan. Yeah. Holy shit, Conan. <laughs> like he, he leaned over and said that. I was like, I love you so much. Yeah. I love you so much, Conan O'Brien. The problem with that show is that he didn't pull on his jacket and make yeah. his tie move enough. He didn't cut his hip. His <laughs> hip was caught. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking stuck. Someone cut me. 
You know, in the years of him doing that show, he never once had Andy come out and cut the hip. Yeah, that's odd. He could have been like, Andy, cut my hip, thanks. He freed me. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, yeah, when you when you when when a when a legend shits on a crowd that you see, it was it's unbelievable. Yeah, because you feel like your coworkers. Well, you are for that moment, your coworkers. And yeah. then he goes to his mansion, and yeah. you're back at the Hampton yeah. Inn. Yeah. Staring out the window. I, no joke. It was a Hilton, <laughs> and I ate Carl's Jr. looking at the old Vivid offices. <laughs> I swear to God. I was just eating a fucking superstar staring at... I was like, oh shit, that's Vivid. <laughs> <laughs> that is always the oddest thing, because here you are, you're on this major fucking TV show. It's yeah. got a giant budget. People, I, I've seen people come up just to take pictures with you as the guy from Billions. Yeah, so no, Big J yeah. fucking loves. Yeah. We work in Midtown, and we have a lot of finance guys in the office with Sirius. <laughs> and Big J knows I hate it, so he just goes extra hard where he'll be like, Mafi, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't hurt. God damn it, Jay! Yeah. And we'll be like, we'll be high as shit. Yeah. And that's when you don't want to get seen. <laughs> and we'll be like, Billions. And I, that's fight, fight. But that's like also that's like the friendship that's the kind of friendship I had growing up that I love that I have with these guys now where it's right. like ball busty and it's like no one thinks they're better than anyone. It's like it's a job. It's not like oh you know I feel like in this business you can get people that glad hand you a lot and they're just like oh my god you're so amazing on that show. But for my friends they're just kind of like oh it's your job. Yeah. I haven't watched it and you're like oh, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. You know they're like. Uh, Sorry, like I don't fucking I don't listen to your podcast. <laughs> fucking what kind of bullshit is that? Oh, an amazing episode. Right. Like, shut up. <laughs> what do you want from me? Literally yeah. nobody has time to hear anybody's podcast. It's yeah. Too, it's too fucking many. It's too much. Yeah. It's too much. The only podcast I listen to, there's two podcasts I listen to, something to wrestle with with Bruce Pritchard, because I like wrestling. And I listen to last podcast on the left. Because it's like cool, funny, spooky stuff. And I'm like, I just listen to that when I play video games. But the rest of it, hey, cool. I don't know. It's weird. It's really weird to be like, did you listen to mine? And you're like, no. <laughs> I thought that was the agreement everyone had. Yeah. It's like, I'll do my podcast if you want to come on it. That's when we'll talk on my podcast. That's, yeah. that's when you listen to my podcast is if you're on it. But it is, a, it's like, um, I really think it's like, I all my friends, we have this. It's work funny. You know when you have a friend at work that you just get excited to see and yeah. you're like, fuck yeah, Steve's working today? <laughs> That's how I feel with all my friends. Right. You show up and you're like, Norman's on this show? Fuck yeah, all right. Now we can shit on other people that aren't here. <laughs> this fucking guy had a shift and fuck him. I, I'll say this. I, I, one of the funniest fucking moments of my life is uh, I came on to do a live bonfire with you guys and you had Norman pretending that he was a 360 in the back and I never saw him yeah. the entire night and it would just be fucking killer joke after yeah. killer uh -huh. joke. This guy's gay. Yeah. Like, yeah, is he here? Is he, is that's like... Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting to describe what like the environment that the bonfire has created but it really is just such a show where i just i'm friends with all those people and yeah. it, i go to work and 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 you know it as a guy that's been in radio forever when you're friends with the people you work with you just show up and you're like this isn't a job no it feels silly it feels like when they let you pick your projects in school with your friends <laughs> we're like what do you want to do and you're like i don't know volcano and everyone's like yeah let's just play video games you're like, yeah that's yeah. a better idea but it is. It's like with Jacob and White Lou and Black Lou and Christine and and Murkface. It's just those are all those are all those are all people that whenever I look back at the bonfire, whenever it's over and whenever it's all said and done, I'll look back and be like, man, it was a it was just so much fun that I can't call. I could never call it a job. I couldn't. No, it's skipping school. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It's skipping school and feeling like you're getting away with something because you are. Yeah, you're you really, really are. Away. My one yeah. of my best friends uh, growing up, Mike Fujak. He, we were in Amsterdam and, and, and Lou Witzke met up with us and he was there with a friend and we were at this cafe getting fucked up and my best friend from high school, you know, Lou was asking him, he's like, do you listen to the bonfire? And my friend was like, no. And he's like, why? He's like, cause I fucking grew up with this guy. He's like, I don't care. Yeah. Fuck that. Right. 
Fuck you. Fuck you, Mike Fujak. <laughs> Fuck you for not supporting yeah. me. Hey, wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be great if we found out that he got in a car accident and oh. died at this exact moment? Dude, I'm Holy gonna, shit, best unmasked ever. Anyone that knows me, anyone that knows me knows I'm gonna frantically call Mike now. <laughs> They're like, good unmasked, like, shut up, Mike, are you okay? Yeah. Are you home, where are you? <clears throat> but he told, like, you know, Lou, Lou was blown away. He's like, you don't listen to the bonfire or whatever. And, and, and Fujak was like, no, nah, man, I grew up with this guy. And then Fujak turned to me and he's like, it's insane that you turned hanging out in the garage into a career. Yeah. Because my mom, we would always be able to smoke weed at my house. That was like the thing where my mom was like, if you're going to smoke weed, do it here and don't drive. So I know where you are and none of you get arrested. And so my house just became the de facto Let's get stoned in the garage. But it's also where we just sit around and bullshit and make each other laugh. And that was like, for my friend to connect that from high school to now and be like, you turn it into a fucking job is like beyond me. Because that's how it feels. It feels like I'm at home with my friends in my garage bullshitting and laughing about dumb clips we've seen on the internet. You're basically saying that your maturity stopped at about 15 years totally. old. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, heavy trauma stunts you. <laughs> yeah. And I fall over will ever be a 16-year-old boy. Well, you, you know, uh, when I sat down to watch uh, Son of a Gary, I was like wondering how deep you would go with this because you, you always talk about anxiety and stuff, but I never have really witnessed it. Yeah. Do you feel like you might have not went as deep as you, you thought from the title? Because you have fun talking about your dad, but I'm sure... It was a lot more difficult. I didn't, doing the Fringe Festival in Edinburgh, I, uh, at, there was a moment where I was like, maybe I go real and go deep and like actually talk about like some of the real fucking sad details of my dad. Cirrhosis is such a fucked up disease to watch someone have because they waste away from the inside. Their kidneys, their liver eats itself. It creates a bile that makes you fucking look pregnant. Your face gets sunken. Like, I walked in and saw my dad on Thanksgiving in 1997, and it looked like a 93-year-old man. See, that's what I'm saying. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could have helped me punch it up before I recorded it, Ron. Where were you in yeah. July? <laughs> so it could have went either way. But it could have gone either way. Yeah. And then I, uh, I, was walking from the, I was walking from the cellar to the stand with Ari Shafir. And Ari was like, I was like telling him, like, you know, I think I'm going to have these moments where I get real. And I talk about it. And he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, you have all these great jokes about your dad dying of drinking. Just go work those out. Go be funny. And it really was like, if you know anything about Ari Shafir, one of his greatest strengths and weaknesses is how purely honest he is. He will just say shit that you don't want to hear. And sometimes you want to hear it, but most of the time you don't want to hear it. And then most of the time he's just him walking around flopping his cock around. But, <laughs> but he said that and it kind of clicked with me where I was like, yeah, that's always what it's been. It's never been like the sad shit's for therapy. The sad shit's for like actually working on it. The, the stage and, and, and comedy has always been like, how do I take this and make this funny and just truly make this funny? And that's always been amazing to me that I could be funny in the shittiest parts of my life. When everything was just like collapsing and you're just like, hey, I'm still, I'm laughing at it. So fuck you. Right. Cause it really is. That's kind of the feeling I had when I was a teenager. I was like, I was so blown away that life could be so sad that I was just like, fuck this. This is hilarious. Just kind of like a, in a defiant way, just kind of yeah. like, I'm gonna make fun of all this shit. And I think it wigged my mom out. Yeah. I think my mom was like, cool. My son's fucking nuts. But I always think it's, uh, Funny when somebody says, yeah, but you're deflecting. You're like, I fucking hope so. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because this, is, yeah, this is a hard fucking place here. This yeah. Planet Earth. Yeah, it's you not. Know? I, think, I think we're, um, what's, what's weird, man, is especially in the age of social media and how everything is marketed now, is everyone is an individual until it's your problem. And then it's like, oh, well, let's not talk about that. You know, like for the better of the group, don't talk about it. But there's a lot of people walking around with heavy shit that need a way out. And I feel like, feel unseen and feel like, ah, you know, and that's kind of, if there was any point to this special, it was like, just laugh at the shit that upsets you the most. And then others, people's other people's shit won't bug you as much. Cause I promise you, if you're mad about shit that you read on Twitter or you read online, 
It's always the same. It has something to do with you. So just go in and fix it yourself and make fun of it. And then all the rest of it is bullshit. Right. Yeah. This is pure yeah. bullshit. Yeah. You really touched them in a big like, way, I yeah, think, I got, Gary. I got four guys <laughs> that are like, yeah. Yeah. Everyone else is like, this yeah. sounds super <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> this guy sounds like a lot of, but, yeah. but I think there is, I think there's a lot of people that, that hear fucked up shit and make jokes and people are like, you can't make that joke. And it's like, but that's how I'm relating to this. I'm not, I'm not trying to, they always try to bring the victims. It's always the third party. It's never the person you're talking about. It's always someone that's like, that's pretty fucked up. And you're like, well, let that, let the actual victim talk. If they're upset that I made a joke about this, Yeah. because it's like, that's the whole point that I, I make that point in the special where I say people with dead dads love dead dad jokes. They do. It's the people with, out with the living dads that have the problems. And they're always like, that's not right. And you're like, fuck you, man. I'm not talking about you. Well, I'll say this. My dad's only been dead for three weeks, so I'm yeah. going to give it a little while. No, Ron, Just jump in now. <laughs> jump in now. Jump in while he can steer, still hear you as he ascends yeah. to the heavens. That's where you want to get him on the way up. Also, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet, buddy. I just, yeah. I do want to officially welcome you to the Dead Dad Club. Yeah, it's a good club. It's a fun club. We have a biannual meeting that none of us show up for because he's never showing up again. Do you know that you said one of the most inappropriate things to me when I came back from the funeral too? I saw you that day. What? You, well, you came on. I'm sorry about your dad. And then uh, it's like, yeah, it's really difficult. And I go, you know, he and my mom have been, we're married for 72 oh, years. I know exactly. And, <laughs> and then Dan said, I, I swear to God, this is true. Uh, he goes, yeah. oh, do you think this is going to be like a Johnny Cash, June Carter thing where <laughs> she goes right after him? <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. And, and <laughs> he, <laughs> He, By the way, he, I said that, and immediately I go, fuck. Yeah. Because I was like, because uh, here's the thing about Ron. Ron is the coolest motherfucker in the world. Ron is, for anyone that knows comedy or has been in comedy, Ron Bennington is... Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm saying that because I still get very nervous to speak to you. Whenever I see you, I'm always like, fuck, this is the most calm I've ever been talking to you. Yeah. And it's on stage on this. But I saw him after and immediately like, oh, man, I'm sorry. And then he said that. And then my just dumb brain was like, oh, man, well, that's always like the next person dies because they're so sad. <laughs> and I wanted to say it in a way of like, oh, your parents really loved each other. But what came off was like, well, get ready for another one. Like, Dude, I remember walking away from that just going like this. Fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> fuck. Because Ron's, like I said, he's the coolest motherfucker in the world. So he goes, yeah. <laughs> Just when I said that, he goes, yeah. I, well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Open my big dumb mouth. Yeah. Normally when I do an unmasked, the, the guest gets really sad. But in this case... <laughs> yeah. The host. <laughs> I fucking. Oh, I fucking fuck, I fucked up. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. No, 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 no. You know what? I blame June Carter. Yeah. I blame June Carter Cash for all of this. You know, she went first. Then yeah, Johnny then Johnny. Second. Yeah. So, so there you go. Theory yeah. broken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we're fine. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. So uh, let me ask you this, though, because you do bring it up and you kind of have fun with the fact that your dad was a heavy partier. But when you figured out to yourself that you were an alcoholic and you had probably been mad at your dad for being an alcoholic for, you know, your whole childhood. How did that feel to, you know, well, I realize that, that you're in the same spot? Took therapy because yeah. I think I was always drinking of being like, no, nah, man, but I'm I'm. My dad died in a way that was like really fucking sad because he just lived with his mom in this small fucking town in Northern California with like white trash, w, capital W, capital T. 
I mean, people that you're like, this is impressive how shitty you are. <laughs> lake people. Are you familiar with lake people? <laughs> if you live by a lake, you either have a lot of money or a lot of demons. <laughs> and yeah. My father was a poor man. So, like the people, his roommate, Jim, they used to, I used to go and I like, the, the only time I saw, so I, my dad kind of stopped talking to me when I was 10 years old. He just kind of like disappeared when he moved from San Francisco to Lakeport, uh, where that's where my grandma lived. And then I stopped talking to him. He just kind of like evaded me, which is in a weird, it's a weird thing for a 10 year old kid to be like, Hey dad. And he's like, uh, I'll call you back. It's like, yeah, we didn't fuck. Why are you, why are you avoiding me? Like I want to be in a relationship with you. They just dodged me like, ah, we can be friends, right? Um, but then they sent me out. My aunt, my dad's sister, sent me to Lakeport. She's like, I want you to go see your dad, and we're going to surprise your dad. And so I like flew out there and surprised him. But when I showed up, it was pretty clear he didn't want me there. It was pretty clear he was like, oh, fuck. I got this kid for a week. Like, I'm supposed to fucking booze up. It was like July 4th, and it's, it's a lake, so they have fucking boats. And it's just drunk people in jean shorts on water. <laughs> a lot of Steve Winwood. A lot of, a lot of solo Steve Winwood. Oh, not, not even traffic not or blind even faith. traffic or blind faith. <laughs> a lot of solo Winwood being played. And uh, it was like the real... I saw for the first time, like, oh, this guy's a fucking... Because my mom would say it when I was at home. My mom was like, your dad's a liar. Your dad's an alcoholic. And I was, I was like, shut up. He's awesome. And then I went out and hung out with him. I was like, oh, fuck. Mom's right. <laughs> and then I didn't talk to him for two years. Again, it just he just, like, I went and saw him. We had a couple phone conversations, and he disappeared. And then he got sick, and my grandma called my mom and was like, you know, Gary's sick. And my mom was like, I got enough money where you can see your dad one last time or you can go to the funeral. So you got to pick. And I was like, I was 14, and I was like, well, I want to see him one more time. And that's when he was all fucking fucked up from cirrhosis. But I was always like, oh, he was a loser. He never did anything. So when I was drinking, I was in New York. I was, I was doing comedy. I had worked in radio. I was like, man, I'm doing shit. I'm not my dad. I just drink because I'm, I'm fun. And then I was in therapy, and my therapist was like, you're your dad. And I was like, fuck you. And he's like, no, nah, it's, it's happened. Like, you're drinking in a way where it's, it's your identity. And that was his identity. And then he died from it. And I was kind of like, ah, fuck. And then I quit booze. And then my career, I, 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 I hate to say cliche, sound cliche or anything, but I like actually started having a real life. I started learning how to build relationships and have real friendships. And I fucking got the most and best work I've ever got in my life. And I got better as a comedian and I was improving. And it was like all these people were around me cheering me on as opposed to being upset that I quit drinking. And that's what I was afraid that I was going to quit drinking. And yeah, I mean, I was afraid. I was like, I was like, I'm going to stop drinking, and no one, because in my mind, Soder, the, like the last name Soder is like, oh, bartender, fun. What's up, man? Let's have a drink. Let's get fucked up. That's what my whole dad's family is like. They're just like that. They're like, ah, we're going to fucking party until the sun comes up. And I was doing that, and I was like, why do I feel like shit every day? And then my therapist was like, you're an alcoholic. And then realizing that and putting that all together kind of freed me from, I think, going down the same path. Well, here's the thing that I'll that I kind of just popped in my mind, and maybe I'm wrong. But when you were a kid and your dad was evading you, yeah, I think it wasn't so much that he didn't want to see you. He didn't want you to see him like that because there's always this thing that you have when you're an addict and alcoholic is later I'll get it together. Yeah. And I'm sure he was running some kind of fucking fantasy in his head that I want to see him when a – when he could be proud of me. You, you know, know, it's crazy you say that because I just remember the look my dad gave me when I was 14 and I came to see him, you know, and he was sick in my grandma's house. And I remember, I remember turning the corner, and, but I remember sitting down to talk to him. I remember like sitting down on this chair next to my dad and he just like looked at me in a way of like, fuck kid, like, fuck, sorry. Yeah. Is it? Because you knew it. it was, it was so 
I, I mean, he died two weeks later, but it's obvious that it was like, oh, fuck, man. You feel like shit because of this. And I never thought of that. I thought I was like, oh, he's always partying, you know? Like, he's, right. got, he's got his life. He's, I'm, just in the, I'm just in his way. And I always felt like that. Like, I was in the way. And then when you see that, when you see a kind of an admittance of guilt, it creates not only sadness, but, like, a lot of anger. Because you're like, fuck, man. Why didn't you get it together? You could have. You could have. And death, anyone will tell you, death is a finality that sucks because it means that relationship can't grow anymore. And I think that's kind of why I was always upset. I was like, man, could have right. fucking, we could have saved it a little bit. But now, I mean, that's kind of a way that a kid thinks. Now that you don't have to see your dad as this thing that you want him to be, yeah. you could think to yourself, oh, I see he was a sick fucking guy. Yeah. You know, and he didn't want me to see that he was a sick guy. Yeah, and I've never, I've never actually never thought about it like that. Yeah. Like, literally, until this moment, I never really thought, like, because, you know, I, I think addicts try to shade, hide themselves from their family that they're affecting. And he did that, you know? And right. I think uh, my mom had a different approach. My mom's drinking got real bad, but then I just got in her face about it. Where I was yeah. like, what the fuck are you doing? And then she was like, all right, all right, all right, chill. At first, she would come at me, and she'd be like, you smoke dope. And you're like, shut up, Trish. And then we yeah. were just like, fuck it. Like, yeah. Dude, you watch my mom and I. We spend more than six days around each other, and we're just like two dogs circling each other. Just like, oh, you're like, oh, it's fucking snapping yeah. at each other. And then at the end, you're like, all right, I love you. I'm sorry. Fuck, that sucked. But she was a person where we had a much more direct, open relationship where i could just be like fuck this i don't like this and she'd be like okay okay and she would listen to me in a way that you know my dad wasn't around for me to listen to listen to me but yeah well you know fathers and sons is a tough fucking game when everything's okay yeah it's still yeah, yeah. it's still hard to talk it's still hard to be real but what you went through as a kid the fact that you were able to pull out of that later is just fucking mind-blowing you know yeah. what i mean like the fun the, the fact that you broke the chain it's so fucking rare. It's so it's, rare. Uh, I mean, and you did it while you were young, is which is crazy. You know? I I honestly uh, I would give credit to comedy because I started being able to do sets and clubs and get paid, and I was starting to work on the road, and I, I did. I was able to do Conan, and, and and I was doing things where I was drinking, but I was getting shit done, and then I was kind of like Brian Koppelman, Brian Koppelman, who created Billions. I, uh, him and David Levine, I've known since about 2007, and I came back from Just for Laughs. I did uh, New Faces Unrepped, as Chris Laker once famously called No Faces. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was the first year we did it, and I came back with, like, management. I came back with management, and I, I, that was when I signed with Brian Stern, who fucking changed my life, who, who got me jobs, and I, I got to stop waiting tables, and I got to start doing fucking stand-up for real. And I remember I went, Koppelman always was like in my life as like a cool uncle. He was like my, I always say he was like my cool young uncle where he would be like, hey, you want to hear stories about Motley Crue in the 90s? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then he'd be like, how shitty are those road gigs? And I'm like, terrible. And he's like, tell me more. Because he did comedy for a little bit. And that's how we met. And I went by his office after Just for Laughs. And I'll never fucking forget. He was sitting there and he was like, man, the one thing in your way is alcohol. And he said it to me in a way that I felt exposed for the first time. Yeah. Where I was like, oh, fuck, because he's a smart guy. And he just saw that. And I was like, and immediately, my alcoholic response was, well, I'm only drinking beer now. <laughs> and he was like, okay. And I was like, so we're cool. <laughs> I remember that. And then for two years, I kept drinking and being like, nah, if I switch to beer, then I don't drink. Then I don't drink hard alcohol, then I'm fine. I can fucking go all night. And then it was, but it was one of those things where, it was the mix of the most successful people I knew were telling me to quit drinking, and everyone that I respected in comedy, I had noticed quit drinking or doesn't drink heavy. They all, like, some people, I noticed, like, Louis C.K. would have, like, a beer. You know what I mean? And it turns out there's other problems. Uh, but... This but is the I, first I heard. What <laughs> happened? What's up with him? Oh, buddy. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, like... I just remember watching all the guys that I really liked and, and none of them seemed to be around getting fucked up. They all seemed to be like busy and they didn't have time to get fucked up. And I was always like, maybe I should quit drinking. Maybe I should quit. And then that mixed with therapy. I, I love the fact that we're doing this in front of a room full of people that are drinking. Yeah. You know, 
They're all like this. It's going to be fucking Patrick, Patrick and fucking <laughs> yeah. and Chris and Paul are going to be like, hey, could you do less anti boo shit? Yeah. They're all going, go back to the yeah. dead dad shit. Yeah. I'll be like, also, you can get yeah. my book, How to Quit Drinking Outside. <laughs> Sign, I'm going to pull a Voss. I'll be selling books outside. You. Outside. You have no idea how excited. I was, we're almost at the end of this, and that cocksucker's name hadn't come up. Ah! Good. Good. So, <laughs> bossroast.com. Yeah, yeah. Let's fucking Fuck yeah. get it through. Go to bossroast.com. Go download the roast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God damn it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it's like, you know, even being able to make that joke, it's still insane because I remember watching fucking bon Bonnie and Voss fall in love watching TV when I lived in Tucson. Right. And you're like, don't date that guy. Yeah. And then now I'm like, oh, fucking Bonnie's love. I mean, Rich Voss is one of my favorite people on the planet. He's yeah. like a guy where he's just, he's, he's in the ilk of Bobby and all those guys where you're like, man, they, they make it. They make you feel like shit, but then they make you also feel like the most welcomed person in comedy. And it's like, I fucking love New York comedy, and I love comedians, I, and I've been look, so lucky to be around some of the best. I've been on the road with them do, doing the creep store, yeah. and I guarantee you, with, thank you, thank you, but I guarantee you, I will be on Dateline talking about the murder-suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, you as a character witness yeah. is going to be... The, I'm sorry that at one point Raina's gonna walk up to you and say thank you for the closure. Dude. Raina's gonna be like, you brought in closure yeah. in my life. Let me tell you something. I don't know what it is about DNA, but that kid is so goddamn funny. Yo, I and have a picture on my phone of on the wall at McGuire's in, uh, in Long Island. There is, uh, at the comedy club, on the wall, it just says, I'm the fucking funniest comic. Reign of Austin. <laughs> it's like she's like I think she was like eight with your eyes. Show that to Bonnie, and Bonnie was like, oh god. <laughs> but that's also what I love. Like I remember, I remember moving to New York, and uh, and Bonnie was pregnant, and Bonnie and Rich would walk in, and I was just an open micer, and I remember Voss being like, look at him, he's scared to look at me, and I was like, oh fuck, oh fuck. <laughs> and then now, whenever I see Voss, I'm like, fuck you, Voss. And it's like right when you walk in. Yeah, it's it's surreal. It's it's so fucking surreal to me to uh, to a have an HBO special, but then for just to be a a comic in New York is it's the best. Well, and also, and this is the thing about you is to have the people that are your peers and, or people that you admire that are fucking cheering for you, man. You have that. There's something about you that people like and respect, and you know. Before I met you, Jay was saying you got to get this guy on, and you know. It was I just... remember the first uh, real person that made me be like, "Oh fuck! Oh my god! Oh fuck! We're becoming friends. This is insane." Uh, Joe DeRosa. Joe DeRosa was like, "Man, I swear to God, that dude, Joe DeRosa. For he's first off, he can take a punch as good as Voss can. <laughs> like that guy takes abuse on a level where I'm like, I almost think he thrives on it." Yeah. But he was always the guy where I would go outside and smoke, and he'd be like, what video game are you playing? Or we'd just talk about video games, and I was like, holy fuck. You know? And then he'd be like, yeah, I got to go to Burr's house. And I'd be like, oh, you're going to Bill Burr's house? And I was like, <laughs> and then I remember I did check spots a lot. That's where they drop checks on the audience, and they bring up a young comic. And I was doing check spots at Stand Up New York, and DeRosa was there. And I was like, yeah, I got to get downtown. I might be able to do another, I might be able to get a guest spot. And he was like, oh, here's 20 bucks. Take a cab. And I remember being like, <gasps> What? A cab? <laughs> and that's just like, that was the beginning. And it was like, you know, I'm, I'm friends with like Joe and then Jay and Nate and List. And it all just kind of comes up. And then you look around. And next thing you know, it's 10 years later. And these guys are all fucking monsters. They are. Just unbelievable comedians. But also like, like family, you know? Like just like there's a family favorite. Like I fucking love you guys. Because they, when you lift each other up and, you, and, you, and you're honest with each other, it just makes... Better comedy, it makes more original comedy. It just makes shit that people, you know, that I'm thankful for, that we have fans that'll come out and fucking see us. It's the fucking best. It's just, it's a great thing. I don't know. You know, uh, I always think about people when to do uh, Unmasked with them, and I always wanted to be at the 
perfect time. But the fact that you have this special and everything going on, yet as young as you are, you're already reflected and you have gratitude. Uh, this is it. This is your yeah. time, brother. Thanks, man. And I wish you every Thanks. good thing. I appreciate it. It was one of the, the real pleasures of my life. It means, means a really fucking honor. Thanks, man. I fucking love you. Dan Soda, everybody. Dan Soda.